Hello, welcome to the viewpoint. I am Mumudu Boj. Um, the whole world now is in, in a state of public health emergency. I mean, unless one is from Mars, <laughs> everybody knows that now. But for us in this country, before this public health emergency, we had been on what can one can refer to as some kind of political emergency. With the defeat of um, President Jame in 2016, the country had embarked on what we call a new Gambia, the formation of a new Gambia. So we instituted um, certain commissions of inquiry and also initiated reforms. Hopefully we can take stock of what had happened during Jame's period, learn lessons from it, and then move forward. But what state are we at? It's been three and a half years. The next elections would be 2021. What have been the successes, if any? And what have been the challenges? And they seem to be innumerable. Here to help me answer those questions and others is um, the Gambian journalist. I'm the host of the popular show on Hot FM this week in politics. And I must add popular, not least because of its informed and incisive analysis of current affairs. I've got today on a video link, he's in England right now, Mr. Isaw Williams. Welcome to the, to the viewpoint. I'm honored to be on. Thank you for having me. Um, um, cheers. Um, so you've been following, no doubt, you've been hearing about the spike we've got in, in this country between July and, and, and August. We've been told that actually we've got the highest rise, the highest increase, numbers of increase of COVID-19 infections all, 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 all over Africa. No doubt you've got family here and all the rest of it. First, your reflections on what's going on right now with our COVID, with our fight against COVID, the pandemic. Well, it's, um, again, thanks for having me on. I think it's quite informative to see what's happening. Um, the first thing in crisis management, and let's get this clear from the outset, that COVID was inevitable. The fact that the Gambia is part of the international community leaves the, the door open for people from all over the world to travel to the Gambia, and thereby the risk of transmission is there. So that much I think we can be clear about in terms of not being immune for, from it. But also there are measures that could have been taken, um, political measures that could have been taken, that um, could have made the crisis a lot less worse than it is, if that makes any sense. First thing you do in a crisis is to tell the truth no matter what. So you under promise and you over deliver. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you tell the situation as it is. Say to the Gambian people that this is a crisis that is going to have a massive impact on our lives, on our livelihoods. That we're going to do our best to deal with the crisis. And also, importantly, having those resources that were given to us before the crisis started. So I normally say that it's always good to fix the roof while the sun is shining, not in the middle of a, a rainstorm, a deluge, which is what we've got right now. And then there are lots of allegations, no least from the Minister of Health himself, of theft from the COVID-19 funds by public officials, which has made the situation a lot worse and has exacerbated the problem. So to go back to what I said earlier, COVID was inevitable, but the effects of it were entirely within our grasp to manage. Um, um, ab absolutely. I mean, for us, it was quite staggering that we had not appointed anybody to be the coordinator, if you like, of a COVID-19 um, um, response team. That happened much later with, for instance, um, um, Alassane Senghor. We know that early on there was a kind of cabinet subcommittee on these things, perhaps headed by somebody who may not have had the competence to handle this, this kind of emergency. And, 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 and this is it. It's like putting the card before the horse. The organizational, some can even say, shambles. I mean, what does that tell you about the, our current, well, I still refer to it as the coalition government. I don't want to refer to it as the better government as such. So what, what, what do you make of that? Well, it tells you all you need to know, doesn't it? I mean, chaos seems to be the watchword. Uh, when you have a crisis, the first thing you do is set up a committee to deal with it on a daily basis in an honest way. So the first thing you do is to inform Gambians about the nature of what it is that we're up against. 
I talked to the Red Cross and they have even alluded to me that part of their shortcoming has been the lack of education of the Gambian people as to the deadliness, if you like, of this virus. It shouldn't take a massive amount of body bags to shock people into doing the right thing. Um, I'm here in England, in southern England, in Kent, speaking to you from the countryside. And one of the big things that the British government did here, for example, was some may say over alarm people. And it basically shocked people into staying in their homes to where the economy came to a complete halt. And then when the government is now trying to get people to go out and spend and get the economy going again, they have a problem because they've already scared, succeeded in scaring people into staying at home. I say in the Gambian situation, what we could have done was to tell people the seriousness of this virus. The first case in the Gambia, March of 2020. We could have used that to inform Gambians instead of just sitting there and saying, well, this could possibly not happen in the Gambia because look around the world, you know, February, March, April, people were dying in droves in Europe and the West. And to see that only one or two people had died in Gambia and probably a couple of hundred in the whole of Africa, made the politicians rest on their laws. They were not being guided by the science, which is where the big problem lies, because if you can't measure something, you can't fix it. And the key thing you talk to any epidemiologist um, is that you have to, first of all, figure out who has the virus. So you test people in massive amounts, not 10 or 20 a day. I'm talking about thousands a day, if you can. That will show you where the clusters are. That allows you to shut certain places down. You don't have to shut the whole country down. Gambia is a, is a relatively small place. But these viruses occur in clusters. They occur in certain places. And if you shut those places down, I mean, as someone once said, this is not a virus that comes to you. It's a virus that you go to. So if you shut those places down, stop the virus from spreading, you can pretty much control it. I mean, Yaya Jame did this, for example, during the Ebola crisis, where the country was pretty much on lockdown, where Guinea was the epicenter and then Sierra Leone. And Gambia's proximity to Guinea is arguably very close. But when you physically shut the country down, you detain the virus. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely. But, but here again, yes, one can understand. I'm not sure how much of this um, COVID-19 denying is happening over there. But here, um, it, it was quite astonishing to, to some of us that a lot of people, you meet them, be it in markets, especially young people in, in certain areas, in hubs where they, they hang out. Even though there's so much information, some might even say that we have a deluge of information in, in many ways. And yet there is this public somehow blasé attitude, do not believe it for one reason or another, the denials, the, the um, 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 conspiracy theories. When you look over here, we have a lot of these things. So how do you communicate? It seems as if whatever communication technique, strategy, whatever we've got in place, it's working somewhat, but again, it leaves a lot to be desired, it appears. Yes, but then also, Mr. Bush, what you also have to remember is that credibility is the currency of government. If a government has a reputation of being corrupt, if a government has a reputation of hiding the truth from its citizens, if the government has a, 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 a habit of lying and believing that people don't deserve to know what is going on. I'll give you an example. During my program, um, there was an advisor to the president called Mai Fati who was sacked unceremoniously and i asked the director of press affairs at the president's office why was he sacked and she told me in no uncertain terms that the president doesn't have to tell anybody why he sacks people so when you have that sort of culture you see a lot of this is about values the values we bring to the job what we think is important do we have the values that says that as an elected government, our number one job is to protect the Gambian people and be truthful to them at all times? I say that to illustrate this point, that if you don't have those values in place, then when a crisis such as this emerges and you say to people, when you need the acquiescence of the public to save lives, frankly, they don't believe a word you say. So if this government had a habit of being honest, open, truthful, and transparent from the start. 
this crisis came about and they say to people, look, the World Health Organization is worried. We are worried. We communicate with you on a daily basis and you keep going on. I mean, you're in the communications business, Mr. Bush. The more you say it, the more people believe it. But when you don't do that, then it, you know, this just collapses like a house of cards, which is exactly what you're seeing right now. Credibility has been lost. No one believes a word of what this government says. And therefore, at a time of crisis, when you need people to do the right thing to save lives, well, the second and third guess you. Absolutely. And what you said there about my fatty, this is what we keep on getting all, all the time over here. Whenever you ask any government minister or advisor or any of them, when you ask them certain crucial details, you are they're unlikely they, they wouldn't g g g g give, you, give you anything. But uh, it, it was interesting um, reading an article of yours that you, you wrote recently where it was indicated that you had spoken to a senior diplomat here and that, 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 that picture, not enough beds, even the testing kits, possibly over one month's <laughs> worth of testing kits. I mean, the, the really dire, dire picture of really what, what is going on here. That, that, that was, that tell us more about this, <laughs> um, your, your conversation with this senior diplomat. Yes, and I, I, I put some of those observations to the Minister of Information, who flatly denied that and said that everything is on par, that... Um, that Gambia is coping very well, and that, you know, his words, my brother, we are not mumus in this country. That's exactly what his response was to me. <laughs> he basically said what I said was not the language of a diplomat, which struck me as very odd, that if you don't like the message, then you have to attack the messenger. That's the culture of politics in the Gambia that needs to change. We need to listen to views that aren't necessarily comfortable. That's the essence of a democracy. That's how you get better. We're not enemies of the government. We're just telling it like it is. And I spoke off the record to a senior diplomat in the Gambia who told me these statistics. Matter of fact, this diplomat had more numbers than I heard from any official from the Gambian government. They were able to tell me, for example, and this was a few weeks back, that 30% of the frontline workers were infected with this virus. That 30% of government officials were infected with this virus. That in March, when the first cases began, 20% of the patients tested were asymptomatic. I'm sorry, were symptomatic, pardon. Um, when I spoke to him a few weeks ago, the diplomat told me that 60 to 80% of people tested were symptomatic. Now, what that means is that these people would require hospitalization. It's not just a case of taking a paracetamol, going home and going to sleep. This is something that is going to need to be monitored. You're going to need people put on ventilators. Ventilators isn't just a cap that you put on your nose and you breathe fresh, fresh oxygen. It is actually putting someone to sleep, putting a hole through their neck, a trachea hole, and shutting off their lungs and allowing the ventilator, the machine, to breathe for them. You need someone to monitor that who's trained. You need someone to know that the blood oxygen mixture is the right amount so the patient will actually not die. This is very intense and technical stuff. And this diplomat told me that ventilators are not the problem. It's the lack of trained personnel. Now, if I were a cabinet minister and you told me that, I would listen to you and go and do some investigation and fix the problem on behalf of the people I portend to serve. Not to attack the messenger, not to score political points, because we're talking here with, about lives of Gambians at stake. And the first duty of a cabinet minister and a government is to protect the lives of the citizens of the country. Absolutely. And in the end, you said you, you talk of the, the possibility of a humanitarian catastrophe. W wasn't that a bit too strong? What do you make of that, that we face such, such, such prospects? Those were not my words. Those were the words of the diplomat. So what I've done, I need to give context to your viewers, that um, I had spoken to this diplomat and under what's called the Chatham House rules, which basically means that I can give you information about something and you can disclose it, but you can't tell 
the source of that information, if you like. It's a tool that journalists use all the time to get to know about what's happening. Because some people don't want to be outed, and if you out them, then that just pretty much shuts your channel for further information in the future. As a journalist, you know you do know uh, thinking, but not necessarily saying. And so this um, uh, uh, diplomat basically told me that um, here is the information that I have gleaned, um, and I will tell you what I need to tell you as long as you don't say it's me. And I said, OK. Now, I took notes of that conversation, and it is those notes that I published that caused people to be bent out of shape because it looks like their inadequacies or their lack of responsiveness was being laid bare. <laughs> Absolutely. So here, I think this would be um, um, a good point in which to broaden out our, our discussions a, a, a bit. As I mentioned earlier, I call it a kind of political emergency. We have formed all these commissions of inquiry so far. It's the Janet Commission have, have, have submitted the, the report and then the TRRC is still going on. What do you make of it, particularly with the Janet Commission, that the way that they had, you know, the picked and chose whatever suited them for whatever reasons. They had their own criteria for deciding which ones to follow and which ones not to follow. <laughs> what, what do you make of that? What does it tell you generally? What patterns of, uh, are emerging with this new, with this coalition government and our, our, our agenda to create this new Gambia? Well, I think the whole theory of a commission is to set it in place get dispassionate people to follow the truth where it leads, quickly report, make the changes that need to be made, and learn from it. Um, in terms of what I think it's doing, well, it's just another thing that's been set up, I presume, to give some kind of political cover to what is going on really to say to western donors and people following the gambia friends of the gambia overseas that hey look you know the gambia is actually doing what it's supposed to do after 22 years of dictatorship it is very easy to make and i'm no apologist for yaya jamea hasten to mention but it's very easy in these times to make him the fall guy and say that well you know look at what's been going on for the last 22 years it's going to take a long time to change the ironic thing about the Janet Commission was that it was set up to look into the corrupt practices of the previous government. Well, if you look at the corrupt practices of this previous, this current government, it gives a lot to be worried about. You know, um, I remember hearing in the commission that um, ex-president Jame was able to write a note, hand it to orderlies, and they'd go to the bank and withdraw money, no questions asked. Now, the question I ask as a thinking individual and I think in Gambian is, are those problems still there? Can the president, as we sit and speak, write a note and hand it to an orderly money from the bank? That's my question. And if no one can give me an answer, which no one has been able to give me an answer, well, then that leaves a lot to be desired. That's the first point. The second point was this whole thing with the Kodole, with the wife of the president basically having a foundation. The Gambia was a British colony. The last act under the British system, the spouse of the leader of the country is not called the first or second or third lady. They're just the wife of the president. They hold no political sway at all. They stand by their husbands, they smile and they travel. And they come back and they represent the as ambassadors overseas. Now what we've had is a complete reversal of that. We've had an office being set up in state house at taxpayers' expense for the first lady. Why? I put that question once upon a time to the information minister. He said to me that that's not their business. Well, I respectfully disagree with that. It is your business because she only holds that office by virtue of the fact that she is the wife of the president. Were she not to have been the wife of the president, if you go to the markets in Banjo, um, no woman selling in the market stalls there has a foundation. They only happen to have it because they are the wife of the president, something that we're not used to in the Gambian political context. That's the first problem. $750,000 gets wired into that money at 10 o'clock in the morning. By 6 o'clock, that exact amount is withdrawn. And responses from State House were like, were, were basically saying, 
to us that they knew nothing about that money. So how come that exact amount was withdrawn? And this is the problem with what we have in the system we've got in the Gambia. It's not just the government's fault, because the government will do that which it is allowed to get away with. It is the failure of the media, the journalists, to go in there and poke their noses and ask the tough questions of this government and to hold them to account. That is what they're there for. And you can't blame politicians for doing what they do if you give the attitude to the, the journalists to be workers in society. Um, surely we, we've had some, some jaw-dropping moments, absolutely, with the FBB Foundation, the Fatima Barrow Foundation, obviously. Some people say that perhaps we have Mary Lincoln to, to, to blame. That was the first, first lady. That was when they started it, 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 Lincoln's wife. But here, one take, this also takes us to what I call the nature of the legacy. From 22nd, this so-called New Gambia, the coalition, we, now we're beginning to know, people were saying it for a long time, the bureaucracy was really all corrupt. There was really nothing there to talk about. When we get to the nature of this legacy, how, what, were the, what were your expectations? What, what could be the reasonable expectations? Because here one gets the sense that, remember, people talk about during Jawara's time, we had this wonderful civil service, but we knew right now, we know, we, 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 we interact with them, we are beginning to know that that quality, that standard isn't there. So one can say something about the government, obviously, but there is a national, there's a bigger, bigger, much bigger problems, perhaps deeper, much deeper problems, that maybe this is just the first wave of the transition, something else will have to change before we can move on. What do you make of that? Yes, and part of the issue is the birth of the coalition itself. So if you look at political theory 101, the whole point of a cabinet is that they advise the head of state. So if you're looking at the presidential system that we have in the Gambia, a cabinet is meant to advise, the ministers are meant to advise the president on policy procedure. And by default, the cabinet is appointed by the president to do his bidding. Now stay with me for a moment. In the coalition, what happened? So we awarded party leaders cabinet positions, ministerial positions. That was the fatal flaw. Because the whole point, the whole raison d'etre of an opposition is prefaced on the idea that they can do something other than what the government is, is doing. If you, if you understand the nature of what an opposition party is meant to do, that's why they are in opposition. If they were in agreement with the government, they'd be in par with the government. Well, the point is that you uh, um, uh, appoint opposition politicians to a cabinet that is meant to be doing your bidding. These guys are by design opposed to you. So the appointment of the, um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, the leader of the UDP, the appointment of the PPP leader, the appointment of, you know, Hamad Ba, the lot of these people, they're all in there because they all believe they can do the president's job. So you're obviously going to have rancor. You're all obviously going to have discord. That was already sewn into the system. It was a genetical defect at birth. So that was bound to fail. It was just a question of time. So and in everyone sense, in there... So, so, in, <laughs> so in a sense, really, there was no opposition. They had all joined the government in many ways. Exactly. They neutralized the opposition. And the fact of the matter was that everyone was there biding for their own gangs and their own sort of clan... Um, agendas, if you like. And and that's what ended up happening. So you had divided government at the very top, which is fatal to any cabinet system of government. Little wonder that folks started getting sacked. And, um, you know, to his credit, Halifa Salah refused to accept a cabinet position because I think he already knew the pitfalls in, in a theoretical sense. So this is part of the problem we had. Now, going on to the civil service, I mean, obviously, the Jawara time, the Gambian civil service was the best in Africa. People actually came to the Gambia to learn to see how a civil service was meant to function. Right now, we have a civil service that's bloated. Let's start at the top, for example. We've got, what, about 20 ministers or so. France cut their ministers from, I think it was 25 to about 10. 
because you don't need that many administrators to run a country. What you need are the technical people behind the ministers. The ministers basically are basically a bunch of loudmouths who just basically come and say, well, this is what needs to be done. It's the technocrats behind the scenes, the technicians, as they're called in the Gambia, the people who have the intellectual firepower to drive policy because that's what they understand. That's their bread and butter. That's what they eat, breathe and sleep. That's how you get a country moving forward. So we've had a bureaucracy that's bloated. The civil service is not fit for purpose. It's it's too many people making too many, um, how can I say, getting too much money from the system, milking the system. Yeah. Let me give you another problem with what we've got. So this whole per diem structure we've got, which has become a money making venture. And mind you, with the lack of the per diems, uh, because no one is able to travel now because of COVID-19, the COVID funds get looted, you know. But we've got them where people are being paid £300 a night for every night they spend outside of the Gambia. Whether they go to Dakar, Freetown, Accra, Geneva, London, Brussels, New York, they all get paid £300 a night. That is unsustainable, firstly. Secondly, secondly, folks are, are known to abuse the system. They take long-haul flights, sit in business class, paid for by the Gambian taxpayer, they go overseas, don't attend these conferences. I would even argue that with COVID-19, it's proven that you don't need to fly halfway around the world to be effective. You can do exactly what we're doing right now. It's called video conferencing, and you can get your voice heard, and people can see you if you're so worried about what people want to know what you look like. Um, you can do that. You don't have to travel. But this has become a free-for-all. It's become a sort of way of getting rich quick. And all you have to do is just empirically look around the Gambia and see the houses shooting up like weeds in a field. Absolutely. It's as if we're still using the, the President Jamia templates in, in, in all sorts of things. So this was precisely a, a, a worry. We remember immediately Baro was sworn in in 2017 and some of us journalists, we sat down t talking about it and we were taking bets. OK, how long before the, the coalition disintegrates? And we, we knew some of us said 18 months, some of us said two years and, and, and that, that sort of thing. But this is really where the problem is. We've got a coalition, they've got no experience in government. So for some of us, we were not really expecting much. And this is really the dilemma. In spite of all this talk of New Gambia, New This, we knew that the bureaucracy wasn't there, the infrastructure wasn't there. This was possibly going to be a long haul. Given this, this reality, what is it that the press can do? You can talk to them, you can bang on their doors. <laughs> they will just ignore you. What do you do? I mean, if we had a Freedom of Information Act, maybe we would go to the courts, but even then you gotta have the money, you get a lawyer, you have to go to the courts where you can implement it. So this is it. We are faced with an extremely difficult situation. People in power really never had an experience. They're trying to find their feet. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Ad hoc, so you have lots of these ad hoc policies that they, they bring in, but a broader strategy one cannot say it. In such a situation, what do we do? The press, individuals, civil society. This is our challenge right now, isn't it? What, what do you make of that? It is indeed. And I will give the government a bit of a break for a second and say this, that it's not just the government's fault. I mean, um, the former information minister, Mr. Jao, commented to me that um, in, a, in an interview, this is public information, and he said in that interview that we were all inexperienced when we came into government. We were suddenly faced with the prospect of running a country. That's from President Barrow all the way down. We were all groping in the dark, were his words. That's a very scary prospect for people entrusted to run a country. Statecraft requires a lot of mental discipline and fortitude and knowledge and experience. There are certain leaders, not all leaders are born the same. Certain leaders come into office and they learn on the job. I'll give you an example. Yaya Jame, when he took over power, probably couldn't even string a sentence properly. But you could tell very quickly that he began to become articulate. He was probably doing some reading, doing some studies. And you could see a desire to want to improve himself. I unfortunately don't see that with the current president. Um, and it's quite worrying because running a country, being president, isn't just about sitting in state house. It's about rolling your sleeves up and going to work on behalf of the Gambian people whom you've sworn
to protect and defend and serve for as long as you're in office. So that's the first problem. But I would say this also, that um, the body politic, there's been a conspiracy of silence on the part of the political intelligentsia in the Gambia. What do I mean by that? So the political parties who are meant to hold the government's feet to the fire, to hold them accountable, have manifestly failed. The political parties dissolve into the bushes, stay there until about six weeks before an election, and then they come out and have their drummings and their rallies and then expect people to vote for them. Now, if you want to see how a party behaves in government, look at how it behaves in opposition. And what you've had in the Gambia is the complete absence of a robust opposition. Um, the MP for Upper Fuladu West, Sana Jawara, said to me last week that the political parties have failed, the National Assembly has failed, that, you know, standing up and opposing the president in parliament is, in his words, seen as unorthodox. It's almost ungambian to oppose the president. <laughs> to which I said, what is the point, therefore, of a political party if you're not able to take forensically the policies of the government apart, analyze it and show where the flaws are? We have a huge problem in the Gambia because I don't think we even understand the instruments of a properly functioning democracy. That is precisely it. This is, this is what we were saying. This is what we face right, right, right now. And there's something you call it the political intelligentsia. I mean, we've got many parties and they've got leaders and, and the like, but whether I would regard them as part of what I call the intelligentsia, perhaps Halifa Salah might qualify it in, in, in that because he's always writing. I was being kind. <laughs> no, perhaps, absolutely. So, so this is it. This is what we are faced with. Even though right now we've got, what, about 14, 15 parties that are all these things um, 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 coming up. How do we sift through that? What would be the role of the media given the crash, dire realities of, of, of our situation here? <laughs> Go to any, any, any minister or, or most of these government public institutions. You talk to them, they wouldn't listen to you. So what, what role, how do we adapt to deal with this as a media force. The intelligentsia will come to that because there is some groundwork going back to first principles to explain to, to, to this country. But now what do you have? People with their 15 minutes of fame. Anybody can get up and think that you are an intellectual because you can string a few sentences together. <laughs> that is really what the problem is. Uh, well, it is. And, and it goes to the heart of education. Um, I was saying to someone the other day that part of the problem in Gambia is that we believe that people with a string of titles after their name are educated. Education isn't just the acquisition of knowledge for its own sake, because anyone can do that. My nine-year-old can be taught to do things and have a certain result. That's not an education. When someone is educated, you're educated out of theft of public resources. You're educated out of tribalism. You're educated out of vendetta politics. You're educated out of thinking that now that you have power, you reign supreme over the people who put you in power. That is what you call a values system. You're educated into patriotism. And patriotism isn't necessarily saying, oh, you know, Gambia is the greatest place on earth, but acting as though Gambia and its people are the greatest on earth. Now, I'll tell you what I mean. You see, there is a lot that happens in this world that's done by code. There was this virus that happened in Wuhan, China, where the Americans, the British, the French, the Italians, the Germans all got their citizens out within a couple of weeks when the virus, it became clear that the virus had come from Wuhan in China. And then who was left in there? It was the African countries, the Ghanaians, a couple of Gambians and Sierra Leoneans, ignored by their governments, begging their governments in Beijing, the capital of China, to get them out, the embassies, to get them out, that um, they'd been stuck as students in Wuhan for 26 days, which is longer than the incubation period of the virus, that they didn't have any illnesses. They just wanted to go home because they were really scared for their lives. At that point, no one knew what this virus was about. This is the first time, you know, it's affected human beings on this planet. So there's a lot of attendant fear to that. It was kind of like AIDS in the 1980s and HIV, you know. So these people were there waiting on their governments to evacuate them, nothing. Give you another example. 
the migrant crisis that we have, of which the Gambia, as a percentage of its population, has of the biggest countries on on these boats of people trying to take the back way from you know um, Libya to uh, Lampedusa. Countries in Africa aren't even bothered by that. This should be a problem that the AU, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, should be worried about in terms of getting governments in Africa to create the right conditions to where their citizens don't gamble 50% chance of drowning in the Mediterranean to leave their countries in search of a better life. So I raise these two examples to show you that the messages that we telegraph to the world matter. If you don't believe what I say, touch an American citizen or touch a British citizen and the might of those two governments will descend upon you like nothing you've ever seen. Oh. Meanwhile, in Africa, yeah. we telegraph to the world that the lives of our citizens are worthless, right? So this goes again to your original question at the start of this interview when you asked me about the COVID crisis. If we'd fixed the hospitals while the sun was shining, when this government came into power, if it made it a priority to fix the hospitals and fix the schools and have quality education, we wouldn't be having this problem because they'd always banked on the fact that if they get ill, they can fly to Europe, to the United States and get cured. They've all banked on the fact that when their kids are of age, they can go to universities in the West. Not every Gambian can do that. But is that fair to the Gambian at home who is left to wallow in the worst possible educational and health care situation through no fault of theirs but when these elites who've gotten their ill-gotten gains are sick they jet out and go overseas for treatment is that fair and that system cannot continue it's not me it's just common sense it cannot be sustained something is going to have to give and the sooner people realize that you can't take people for fools anymore. There's one great thing called the internet. It's the great leveler. Now you can't lie to your citizenry anymore because within seconds, they see what's happening out in the world there. They know what's possible in other worlds. They know other worlds are possible, that other living conditions are there, that people can actually have a dignified and, and worthwhile life. Yet why do they continue to wallow in poverty? You go to Bansang, you go to Basse, and it's like medieval times. Gambia is stuck in a time capsule. That can't be right. Uh, absolutely. And all the lies have really unraveled because right now, whereas before they could just fly out, now you can't. You have to stay in here with, with, with everybody else. And, and earlier on, you, you mentioned um, um, education, which is really the key. Uh, we remember one time our former um, Secretary General, Jebus Langley, once one said that some people are certificated, others educated. That, that, that was a quite profound <laughs> observation there. We went through high school to try to decipher what he was, he, he was trying to say. But this is it. Somehow, our, with our so-called elites, even though I'm not sure whether I will have of that band of people that one can call, in the true sense of the word, elites, it seems we seem to have had a kind of bourgeoisification, <laughs> as, as it were. They, they're more interested, as it were, in, in you know, um, the, the car, the position, and, and, and that, that, that sort of thing. And, and constantly we keep on being banging on about the demographic dividend, the demographic dividend. But the fear is this. The education completely shambles. We've been in, in, in education at a school for eight years. And we realize what's been going on. Most of these people were being s uh, sold short. Some person even said that you have a kind of um, educational apartheid in, 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 in this country right now. I was listening to a teacher in Chamin the other day saying stuff like, um, during Jawa's time, when you finish maybe primary six, you could write. But right now on the Jame, people could finish grade 12. They, they couldn't even write, bringing, giving us that, that, that contrast between these things. Education is deeply, deeply flawed here. Maybe people with money can send their kids to Marina or Seebeck or whatever. But again, the vast majority of people are not getting the right education. That is very, very, very worrying in an economy that cannot absorb them. What, what's the training? What's going to happen next? It's, it's really very worrying prospects. What do you make of that? Yes, and it's, it's, it's frightening because you think about it and 
education, a, a country's biggest resource are its people. Um, a country is made great not because it's got skyscrapers and it's called the United States. It's because people there are learned and educated in a system that rewards meritocracy. So the best become those who basically are, a, as you call it, the elites or the top of society. The problem we've had in Gambia, really, is a problem of poverty, to where everything is linked to material wealth. So I was in the Gambia some time ago, a couple of years back, and met an old friend at the beach. And if you know anything about me, you know, as the as the Wolofs have always said about me, manda <laughs> And um, my wife, my wife will agree too, because. Um, you know, I can I can have the same shirt for 20 years. I think I have a, a yellow Gamtel T-shirt that I still had from the 19, the late 80s when Gamtel just opened up. And an Air Gambia T-shirt as well, which I still have from back in the day and I still wear. That's how nai I am. But the fact is that I was in the Gambia on holiday and a friend, an old friend, met me on the beach and he said, Ah, boy, nakam. I said, oh, fine, thanks. He said, so for nekani. I said, oh, at that time, I think I was in Texas. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in the States. And he says, no, Lulu Dudega. I said, ah, haka. He said, ah, you're still not asleep, I see. I said, oh, well, that's, that's, that's what I have. He says, no, you're from now, Freetown, Ganeka. I said, oh, okay, well, bah, now, I didn't have to prove anything. But my point, I say that to illustrate this, and we laugh at that. But this tells you all you need to know about what's going on in here with our people, you know. And everything is linked to materialism. What you have, the car you drive, the houses you build. I've not seen so many, um, uh, how do you call it, two, three, four-story buildings in the Gambia than I have anywhere else. I mean, people are just building just because they're building these monuments and these edifices to their own glory and aggrandizement. You know, so in the Gambia, where you've been says a lot about you. I mean, this is the one country where I know that. You're traveling to the airport and you get accompanied by 20, 30 people to see you off because Danga Tuki, as someone once said to me, you know, talk toro tuki teki, you know. And the point is that people have put so much on materialism that that begins to define even the politicians in office. Look at what's happening in fisheries right now. We've got the Chinese trawlers sitting at Denton Bridge at our eco fragile system where these women go to harvest their oysters. These are the nurseries for our small fish that grow and float into the Atlantic Ocean and become big fishes. Those trawlers aren't designed to be there, but they're there because somebody through a hood or a wink is getting paid to turn a blind eye. It happened with our Rosewood. It happened with Rosewood coming from Senegal into the Gambia. The Gambia is fast becoming a gangster's paradise. And the soonest we wake up to this, the better we shall all be. We're going to be one of the most corrupt countries in Africa in the next decade if we continue down this path. And we're also sleepwalking ourselves into a failed state if we continue like that. This is dangerous. This is very, very fragile times for the Gambia. Yeah. And people need to understand yeah. that this Gambia situation isn't just going to affect those that have not at the expense of those at the expense of those that have the world bank figures indicate that about 60 percent of our population is below the age of 25. think about that for a moment absolutely now if stay with me for a second if we say that political consciousness awakens in an individual at the age of about 13 that's when you begin to understand politics and see cause and effect and connect the dots. If that happens at the age of 13, and let's say Yaya Jame was in office for 22 years, my rough calculations, 13 plus 22 gives you, what, 35, mm -hmm. which means that every adult below the age of 35 in the Gambia today, which is going to be more than 60% of the population, Absolutely. has known nothing but tyrannical and dictatorial rule. That is shocking. Now, though, unlike... You know, I know I don't want to say you're old, but unlike you and I, <laughs> who've had an experience with the Jawara regime, who can go back to a time when things were much more 
innocent, if you like, where you could walk into Sona stores and bump into the president of the Republic of the Gambia holding his basket and doing his shopping. And I looked in his basket and I saw Life Boy soap and palm leaf <laughs> soap in Sona stores. Yes, this is in the late 70s now. Absolutely. And this was an, a time when life was much more honest and straightforward. Fast forward that to today, where everybody is going in for per DMs, where it's a case of let's loot the coffers because in 2021 we may not be here. This is not the way to run a country. And the journalists, again, talking about what journalists can do, can make this their life ambition to root out corruption, to publicize it, and to name names. Absolutely. I mean, um, but, but, but this, is, this is really a very, very crucial point, especially earlier when you gave us that anecdote about that person on the beach and that, that, that mentality. So, so, so this is it, because um, we, t we tend to say that how we live as, um, 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 as a collective is a reflection of how we live as individuals. So we tend to tell, I tend to tell people, tell people here over here that you really cannot get a scapegoat. We just cannot simply sit and say, oh, it's the government that's doing this, or it's the government that's doing that. Can I be one thing? And then form a government that is different from what I am, if you know what I mean, because of that culture of patronage, as, as we call it, almost sort of feudalistic. You know, you have the lord of the manor, <laughs> and everybody else is dependent on you, and, and that, <laughs> that, that, that sort of thing. So for, for me, this is the challenge. The people somehow, generally, we seem to be one thing, but we want our government to be something entirely different. I am not sure how we can pull that one off. What do you make of that? That is logically impossible to do because <laughs> the government is the people. It's the people. And the people make up the government. Yes. Um, don't be surprised that, you know, for certain public officials whom I won't name, when you confront them with an issue, their first line of response is to be defensive and to not accept what you're saying with good grace and decency, which is what an education does for you. Absolutely. You talked about education earlier. The first sign of a good education is good manners. Okay. If someone comes to you and says, you know, hello, Mr. Mbocha, you're the minister of, I don't know, minister of finance. Ah, the department. And the first thing you say is money. No, we know we, who told you that that's a lie. This is no, you want to hear because um, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who once said, we thank God for our enemies because they show us our faults. Now, if you're concerned about running a good government in the Gambia and good governance, you would welcome views that differ from yours because it gives you two things. First of all, it gives you a view into what other people are thinking. So you don't have an echo chamber around you of people basically saying exactly what you believe. And secondly, it shows you where you're going wrong so you can make corrections. What we've seen in Mali over the last few days, for example, has been very instructive. You've had Ibrahim Boubacar Keita at the head of a government that was corrupt, inept, and unable to deal with the security situation in the country. Then what happens? Military generals, men in camouflage and dark glasses, take over the government. And now they've pushed him out, a democratically elected government. We're all the worse for it in Africa because now we've gone back to the 1980s. We've moved the clock backwards. The African Union had a charter in it against coups. Guess what? The generals in Mali could care less. ECOWAS went in there, led by good luck Jonathan, to try to talk them out of, of their current misguided uh, view and to reinstall Abu Bakr Keita back into government. They kicked them out and told them what happens in Mali is for Malians to decide. And that in three years, we will think about handing back power to a civilian. I think we all know how this movie ends. We've seen this same song and dance all over the continent, you know. And so we're back, the 1980s are back now in the 2000, 2020. And that's the problem. So you cannot have a government that's nascently corrupt, that's continuously corrupt, that's deliberately corrupt, and uses corruption as a means of empowerment. You cannot do that. Something is going to happen. And the problem with the Gambia is that we have a government that's hopelessly compromised and corrupt. The first problem I had was when they moved Gaipa away, the import and, import, uh, import and export department, into State House. And the question then becomes, what's the journalist doing? They should be all over this story like white on rice, saying, hang on a second, 
We have an import-export agency for a reason. If you want to invest in the United Kingdom, you don't come and see the Queen. You sure as hell don't come and see Boris Johnson. You go to the Department of Trade and Industry, and the civil servants will show you how to go about doing it. You'd be even lucky if you meet the Minister of, 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 of Trade and Investment. You know, when you go to the civil servants, they show you how to invest in what companies in which in which parts of the country. But what we've done in Gambia is we've moved it into state house. And the question then becomes why? And no one is answering that question. Absolutely. That's that's really yeah, yeah, yeah I'm a template in, in, in many ways. And we understand when we're talking to I'm listening to Jagan Gray Johnson the other day talking about how procurement actually has also been taking um, um taking o o o o over there and, and the fact of I mean government listening uh, 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 as it were instead of being in this co um, constant state of denial. I, I remember one time back in the eighties Baba Karge and, and the former president, apparently that was um, um 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 things that shouldn't have been done at Janjambure prisons and Baba Karge put that point to the president. The president said, well, I'm not so sure. I will go and find out. <laughs> then we will come back. Exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly the sort of, the sort of attitude we, 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 we want. But now we, we're coming towards the end of the program. Um, so what, now what next for civil society? For, 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 for journalists? Yes, you know, we keep on banging on. We'll have to continue keeping on banging on. But here, I once heard you refer to um, journalism or journalists as an intermediary. Does the concept of advocacy or even activism, is that part of that intermediary? One wonders. I think journalists are, yes, they are intermediaries. They're also midwives. So a midwife doesn't tell you that your baby is ugly or pretty. A midwife births the baby, cleans it up and hands it over to the mother and says, that's meet your new child. And I think that's what journalists are. We're supposed to be pursuers of truth. And oftentimes politics, the politics of non-democracy, the undemocratic politics, and look at it around the world. The countries that tend to thrive are the democracies, the open societies, the societies that tolerate dissent, that allow people of differing views and mindsets to also have their time. If you start to stifle that, then what you have is a police state, a state where people don't dare speak truth to power. And then that begins to sow the seed of problems. For example, again, as you, see, as you saw in Mali a few days ago. So what journalists can do, really, is to be fierce advocates of the truth. You know, um, as I said, politicians always speak a strange language. And the job of journalists is to decode that language. We are professional decoders. That's what we do for a living. But also, the journalists in the Gambia should stop being partisan. I know there's a lot of politics in journalism in the sense that these journalists want to get in good with officials in government. They should resist that temptation. I mean, one of the most shocking things I heard Adam Abaro once say was that he was approached by a journalist uh, and was asked for money if he wanted favorable coverage on a certain subject matter, I don't know what. And to which I said, if that is in fact true, he should name the journalist and that journalist should be shamed because what he or she has done was to put our profession, our noble, decent, honest and straightforward profession into disrepute. And that person needs to be disowned and the uh, public needs to know who they are. That wasn't done for good reason, because I suspect that scenario never actually happened. But put that to one side. You're always going to have a government that is insecure, that is weak, that is corrupt, rignaled, always is going to look at the journalist and say that, well, yes, these people are causing trouble. We don't cause trouble. We're telling the truth. I should be able to pick up my phone and call any minister now, but they won't talk to me because they think I'm going to unearth their ineptitude. And that's not the point. The point is the Gambian people need to know who on earth is exercising power in their name. Absolutely. And when you've got public officials who would rather thrive in the dark and sunlight being the best disinfectant would shun sunlight like bats, then we've got a huge problem in that country. Absolutely there. We've come to the end of the program. Um, naming and shaming. That should be our mantra. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Isol Williams, for, for, for your rather 
instructive, really, views there. It was really wonderful, wonderful, really enlightening. Thank you very much, really, for taking your time to join us on the viewpoint here. Really, much appreciated. It's my and, pleasure. Thank you. Yes. And thank you very much, viewers, for joining us on the viewpoint. Until the next time, I am Mumudumbuch. Stay safe. Bye bye.